prophecies have you seen bring Jewish people to faith in Jesus? Well, the one I just mentioned, Genesis chapter 3. Yeah. It's amazing because most people... People wouldn't think to look there. No, it's no. the first one, though. Yeah. It's the, 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 the technical term is the proto-evangelion. Mm. It's the first announcement of good news. Yeah. Shalom, my friends. This is Yehuda Yisrael, and thank you for joining me for another video where we debunk Jews for Jesus. So this is the head of Jews for Jesus. His name is David Brinkner with our... As you know, Jeff Morgan, the evangelical Christian uh, Jewish man who is kind of the face of Jews for Jesus. Anyway, so this is another video where we are going. I, I said in my last video that I was going to debunk the Christian position on Genesis 3.15. Conveniently enough, uh, they were focusing on that in this video. So let's hear what they have to say about it, and then we will debunk accordingly. And in that announcement of the one who's going to come, who is born of the seed of woman. Mm -hmm. Now that word zara is used not for women, but men's contribution to the reproductive cycle. Yeah. And yet here it is, the seed of woman? In the very beginning, what are we talking about here? And this offspring, this person announced. So let's look at Genesis 3.15 under the microscope. It's one verse, right? <laughs> And he shall place between, he sh and, sorry, it says, and I, this is God speaking, and I shall place hatred between you and between the woman and between your seed and between her seed. He will crush your head and you will bite his heel. Traditionally, right, and just according to, this is, you know, of course, the punishment that was given after eating from the eight sadas from the tree of knowledge, and all the subsequent, uh, you know, punishments and the consequences for that sin that God gave to, uh, you know, the offspring of Eve and, and herself as well as the serpent. Now, this is clear, A like, like when you think about today, it's very obvious that snakes go around biting the heels or biting, you know, because they're on the ground that... You know, they're just set up that they're able to bite the heels of humans. Okay, great, right? And, and humans are set up where we can step on the heads of snakes to prevent them from biting us. That's really all the verse is saying in the plain sense. Christians, however, like David Brinkner and, and New Testament believers, get obsessed with this verse because the New Testament relates it to Jesus in this exclusive sense it sounds is that christians will not allow for the interpretation that this verse could have anything else to do with anyone but it only can refer to jesus right now that's a problem because it doesn't really make much sense when you look at the verse that it would be exclusively about the messiah you can see other videos on my channel where I describe, and I'll put the links in the description, where I explain the difference between an ex a prophecy that is, is exclusive to the Messiah, Son of David, and no one else, versus a prophecy that has more ambiguity and might have future application to the Messiah. So we'll get into that as we go, but let's hear what they have to say about this. In the very beginning of the Bible is going to come, and he's going to crush the head of Hasatan, mm -hmm. the adversary, as represented by the serpent in that new first story of the Bible. Yeah. He's going to crush him. He's going to, that's how you kill a snake. Yeah. You crush the head. Yeah. And in that process, he's going to have his heel bruised. In other words, he's going to suffer in that process. It's a, first of all, it's the first announcement of God delivering people from the adversary who started everything from the beginning. So we know the brokenness is there and God plans to deliver it. How is he going to do it? The seed of the woman. It's the first announcement that there's something about the woman. And ultimately Isaiah tells us it's because there is going to be a virgin who will give birth. So obviously this is absurd. Let's talk about the seed of the woman, you know, narishkeit that he's getting into. 
there's nothing unique about the seed of the woman if we look in uh, elsewhere in the Tanakh, the most famous being used, and this is something you've probably heard before if you're familiar with the argument, right? When Hagar, the mother of Ishmael, right, uh, one of the you know wives of, of Abraham, had her son, right, she is described as having seed, right? <laughs> it says, return to your mistress and allow yourself to be afflicted under her hands, right? God is speaking to, uh, or the angel rather, right, through through God is speaking and saying, Hagar, Sarai's servant, where are you coming from and where are you going to? And he said, and she said, from before Sarai, my mistress, I am fleeing. And the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and allow yourself to be afflicted under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your seed. And it uses this form of the word, it says, Zareach, right? So her seed, right, is being multiplied. This is the seed of the woman. So if you're going to use this logic that this seed word can only, you know, uh, it's something that's unique to the male reproductive system in the way that it's the contribution as, as uh, you know, David Brinkner was trying to argue. You have a problem when you look at the way that word is used regarding Hagar and her seed. Now, a lot of Christians will get into semantic linguistic arguments that are very nuanced and, and try to argue that there's a difference between the way it's used grammatically, this is really pathetic. Like it's the same root word, you know, like it's, there's really no way around it. Like the, the argument of exclusivity in Genesis 3.15 is, is extremely weak when you see how the word is used, right? So knowing that, right? Now, I like that argument. Like I really do like the argument with, with Hagar and I think it does a lot, but I think there's an even better argument that you can use against Christians regarding this. Now, I'm going to say something that a lot of people who are familiar with counter-missionary work um, might actually be a little bit triggered by. And I'm going to say that I don't necessarily fight the messianic interpretation of this verse. I don't even necessarily fight the idea that there's a metaphorical understanding that the snake could be related, you know, to the to the Satan in some way, right? That might be surprising for you to hear, but the reason why I do that is that the Christian isn't going to change their mind about this. And they're also going to try to, you know, distort the context of rabbinic commentaries and try to say, you know, if there's anything that they can find to link this to. And I, I, I don't want to give them the satisfaction. I want to meet them where they're at, right? Fine. You want to say this has future messianic application? Great. But do not tell me that it is exclusive to one woman and one seed, namely Mary and Jesus, and that it only refers to, to Satan and it doesn't refer to the future generations of Eve and the future generations of the snake. Because that's clearly what the verse is referring to in the plain meaning of the verse, the pshat, as we would say. And there's no contradiction there with the rabbinic interpretation, right? We, we see that this is the way it's, it's understood. Now, there's a very famous messianic prophecy that even Christians have to agree refers to a future messianic time that Jesus did not fulfill. And that refers to Isaiah chapter 11, which... If you know anything about Messianic prophecy, I'm sure you are familiar with this. But there's an interesting verse here, right? Because this is the, the you know, famous argument that world peace has to happen with the coming of the Messiah, right? So you have the shoot shall spring forth from the stem of Jesse, which refers to the line of King David, which will ultimately culminate in the future Messiah. And it talks about the spirit of the Lord resting upon him and fearing God and spreading knowledge of God. And it talks about this future era of unprecedented world peace where the wolf shall live with the lamb, right? This fa the most One of the most famous messianic prophecies here, the leopard shall lie with the kid, the calf and the lion cub and a fatling shall lie together and the small child shall lead them. And then basically talking about even like nature will change 
in this peaceful way and there's not going to be, you know, predators won't eat prey anymore and everybody will, all the all of the entire food chain, <laughs> you know, they're not going to be uh, a predator-prey relationship anymore. But look at this verse here regarding humans and snakes. It says, and an infant shall play over the hole of an old snake and over the eyeball of an adder and a weaned child shall stretch forth his hand. They shall neither harm or destroy on all my holy mount, for the land shall be in the full knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the seabed. So clearly a future messianic prophecy relating to the future third temple and all that, but this is the focus of the video is Genesis 3.15 with the relationship between humans, the offspring of Eve, and the snake, which is clearly referenced here and Isaiah chapter 11, verse 8. This is why I will not shy away from the interpretation that this has something to do with the future Messiah, because it does. But that being said, Jesus did not fulfill this messianic prophecy, Isaiah chapter 11, right? Sorry, I'm in Genesis 16. I meant to go to Isaiah chapter 11, right? We're familiar with Isaiah chapter 11, the world peace prophecy, and a part of that world peace is that the infant and the snake, the offspring of Eve and the offspring of the snake, will not be at odds with each other. They, the snake will not be striking at the heel and the, they'll be playing together. So Jesus did not fulfill that, even if we assume that Genesis 3.15 is messianic. You see, you provide, instead of fighting the Christian on, no, Genesis 3.15 is not messianic, you agree with them. Yes, it's messianic, but Jesus didn't fulfill it because it says that the nature of the snake, because remember, before the sin of the, you know, eating of the tree of knowledge, there wasn't this enmity between Eve and the snake, right? They were, they were pals. They were, you know, <laughs> they were all copacetic. Everything was cool, you know, until, you know, obviously the snake tricked them, but this is saying that that's not going to happen anymore in the times of the Messiah. And if somebody challenges this idea and they say, oh, well, it can't, it can't refer to, uh, you know, this and, and your rabbis say something different. Actually, the rabbis agree. In fact, the Radak brings this down. Um, and I'll prove it to you right now. It's in Hebrew, so you won't be able to read it if you don't know Hebrew. Um but I'm going to copy paste this. I'm going to put it into Google Translate here and you can do this yourself and check it out. So toward the end, it says, it says, and behold, the enmity of the snake that was derived in the days of Genesis with man will go away in the days of the Messiah and all the land of Israel. Look at that. See the wisdom of, of the rabbis, how amazing this is. The rabbis weren't fooled by this idea that Jesus dying on a cross got rid of the sins of the world and therefore Genesis 3.15 only applies to Jesus. Oh no. The rabbis knew, as the Tanakh, you know, as Isaiah knows, that in order for this curse of Genesis 3.15 to be reversed, the true Messiah will come and not just crush the head of Satan, but will also undo the enmity between humankind and snake kind, as the shot clearly says. So clearly we have a better answer, even from a messianic perspective, as to what the Messiah will do, and that is, stop the enmity between the offspring of Eve, not just the Messiah, but all mankind. That is the role of, the, of, of what the future messianic era will bring, not just Jesus defeating Satan. That was, that it, it's not exclusive to the Messiah. If you want to say that when the future Messiah comes, that this will be fulfilled, of course, the Jews agree, the Christians agree, but Jesus didn't accomplish any of that. So you don't have some exclusive claim to Jesus fulfilling Genesis 3.15 because he didn't. Snakes are still fighting with women and fighting with the offspring of the woman. 
<laughs> There's no way around that. So I hope you guys will use this argument instead of trying to argue that it's not about the Messiah. Sure, it's about the Messiah. It just wasn't fulfilled by Jesus. And it's not exclusive to the Messiah because it refers to the relationship of humankind with the relationship we have with snakes and that that will change along with all the other, you know, relationships of predator prey and enmity between animals and, and humans and, and other animals. So yeah, let's finish this up just to see what they have to say. Amazing. Yeah. A miraculous story. Yeah. And we can talk about that prophecy as well, because that's the one that most often we're accused of misinterpreting. And it's absolutely a stunning prediction that was fulfilled in Yeshua that Matthew talks about in the very first chapter of the New Testament. And then on top of it all, it predicts the crucifixion because in the process of crushing the serpent, this seed of the woman, this Messiah who is promised actually dies as well. Mm. If, a, if a snake bites your heel, you're in big trouble. Yeah. And so this all is an amazing picture that is ultimately, it's the, the, the outline of a picture that the rest of the scriptures fill in the contours and the color of God's promise of redemption. And it begins in the very beginning of the Bible. Well, then so much for the, the Hebrew... So, yeah, this is obviously a silly, like, stretch for them to assume that this predicts the crucifixion. Once again, the crucifixion did not do anything described in Isaiah chapter 11 with regards to solving the problem of sin and solving the enmity between the woman, you know, the seed of the woman and the seed of the snake, right? If we were walking around today and you could say that Isaiah chapter 11 was fulfilled, okay, then, okay, I guess Jesus is, uh, you might be able to make an argument for that. I mean, it's not cause and effect uh, direct, but, you know, <laughs> you don't even have that, Christians, right? Christians don't even have that to, to carry themselves on this. So I hope you guys will use this approach. Um, I'll just, you know, as a plug for my final sort of thing I want to introduce to you Please. some some videos that you can look into um I do a whole thing on Isaiah chapter 714 um I think you should check that out if you want to learn how to debunk that and then I also have a video that was kind of older but I think it's important I call it the top 5 mistakes counter missionaries make when debating Christian missionaries I think you should check that out if you want to learn how to uh, deal with these prophecies like Genesis 315. Because I think uh, the approach that I like to use is, is not necessarily fighting the idea that it can refer to the Messiah, but just showing how we have a better answer, even from a messianic perspective, where Jesus still didn't fulfill the prophecy, even if we apply Genesis 315 to the future Messiah. So yeah, I hope this video has been a blessing to you. Please Give us a like, subscribe to the channel, and share with all who you think would benefit from this. We gotta, we gotta stamp out the falsehood of the, you know, the the Christian, uh, you know, lies. So in in the same way that they claim that, uh, you know, their false Messiah stamped out, uh, <laughs> you know, Satan. Let's actually do what Jesus failed to do and spread the truth of Hashem and the truth of the Torah to the world. Hope this video has been a blessing to you all. Shalom Aleichem.